Good morning. Sorry for that. I just, Debbie has reminded me before that when you don't have the platform for uh, short of people, it becomes the, the, if you remember years ago, the Queen visited the United States and she was at the White House. I think this is under George W. Bush. And uh, she was given a podium and she's a very short woman. And what you saw was the talking hat. And uh, so Melissa's not particularly short, but I wanted to give her the advantage of some additional height here. Uh, as the bishop has reminded me, it's appreciated. Well, we continue our worship today uh, for this sixth Sunday of Epiphany with our seasonal greeting, which is printed in your handout that you have at the very top. I will make you a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And I invite you to join with me now on page 124. Page 124, please join with me in the colic for purity as we pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We may be seated for the lessons. The 
Old Testament reading this morning is for the, from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in a man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhibited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm this morning is Psalm 1. We'll read responsively by whole verse. Blessed is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stood in the way of sinners, and has not sat in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and all his law will meditate the day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the waterside, that will bring forth his fruit in due season. His leaf will also be not bitter, and will, whatever he does, it shall prosper. As for the ungodly, it is not so with them, but they are like the chaff with which the wind scatters away from the face of the earth. Therefore the ungodly shall not be able to stand in judgment, neither the sinners of the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The epistle this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 20. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead, is, that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you would please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel by Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. And Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch Jesus, for power came out of him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven." For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, 
for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please join with me in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us as we are sinners. Lord Jesus Christ, send the Holy Spirit again to be in and with us to remind us that our sins have been taken away by you as we call on you as our Savior and Lord. Send your Holy Spirit now in peace and consolation and joy as we rejoice at the gifts that you have given us. So help us to freely pass that knowledge and that gift along to others. In your name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Our lessons today really paint a very clear picture for us. I am a visual person, and so I appreciate that a great deal. I want you to envision an intersection that's a T. There's one road coming through, and then it intersects with another road, and you can either go left or right, but you're not supposed to go straight. And I was having some discussion with Joy and Jan earlier to try to figure out the name of the road uh, that St. Louis Road, I think, intersects with, what was it? McRae's Mill. You know where that's at? There's a, there's a house. I, you know, I, I grew up in Manning. And, you know, when you're in Manning and you need something, you come to Sumter, unless it's greater than that, and then you go down to Charleston and that type of thing. So we often went to Manning, and we often went that route. And I remember that, that house, it's been there a long time. And I remember growing up and it was not uncommon to see a vehicle inside that house. People tend to run that stop sign like it's just a suggestion. And they go straight through it and they would drive into that house. And over the years I saw that house put up a fence. Originally a wooden fence and you know what I saw? A wooden fence mowed down and a car in that house. And then I saw them put up a, 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 a concrete or something like that, brick. And I saw the brick mowed down in a car in that house. And then somebody got wise. And I saw that they had put I-beams, steel I-beams, and driven them in the ground. And then they bricked around it. And now what you see is a brick fence with the brick destroyed and a car wrapped around the I-beam but the house is safe. I want that picture for you because that is the image that the scriptures are painting for us today. We are coming to a T intersection and thou shalt not go forward. You must choose right or left. And the choice is laid out for us beginning in the first reading from Jeremiah. And I'm just highlighting it because all of these scriptures lead a little bit more into that discussion. The first of Jeremiah 17, 5, listen to it carefully. Thus says the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. That's different than just the L-O-R-D. This is capital. It's the technical name of God, the tetragrammaton, the Lord God Almighty. Just in case we get a little confused, the scriptures want us to know this is the Lord God Almighty, the creator of everything, the sustainer of everything. This is the Lord God Almighty speaking. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Now look at the seventh verse. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D whose trust is in the Lord. Repeat it. There's your choice. Blessing, if you trust in the Lord God Almighty, and cursed is the man who trusts in man and does not follow the Lord God Almighty. And then verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Now, my friends, this is speaking specifically of the heart. 
But do you remember that little character named Jiminy Cricket? And he gave us some bad advice. He said what? Let your conscience be your guide. Let your heart be your guide. Let your mind be your guide. Well, now there's a truth in that, and then there's a false statement in that. If your heart, and if your mind, and if your conscience is formed by the scriptures, you have a better chance, a better opportunity of doing God's will. But sadly, and I preach to myself also, we don't know the Bible and we tend to be, remain sinners and we tend to pick and choose the scripture verses that we like and put the ones that challenge us down like it we're, as if we're at a buffet. And so the reality is, is we need to know the diagnosis, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. And I would argue, based on the scriptures, that applies to the mind and to the conscience also, unless it's formed by the scriptures. And even then, it needs to always be tested. Whatever great new idea I have needs to be tested against the word of God to see whether it's consistent or inconsistent. Flip over in your lesson to the psalm today. There's a saying, and I, I attribute it usually to Bits, uh, Bishop Fitzsimmons Allison, but I, I don't think it's original to him, and it's this. The best commentary on the scriptures are the scriptures. The best commentary on the scriptures are the scriptures, and I would like to present to you Psalm 1 as a commentary on Jeremiah's lesson today. In fact, notice the similarity. Blessed is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stood in the way of sinners, has not sat at the seat of the scornful. Blessed is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the ungodly. And it goes on to flesh that out like a commentary on Jeremiah. But there's one little problem that we need to observe. None of us fulfill verse 1. None of us all the time, forever and ever, have not walked in the counsel of the ungodly. We're all sinners. Thank God we are sinners of Christ redeeming, right? There's joy in that. I, I preached on that briefly last week. But my point is, verse 1 is really about Jesus. He's the only one who has truly never sinned. And therefore, he is truly blessed, for he has not walked in the counsel of the ungodly. We read the Psalms through the lens of Christ. Now, when I say that, I mean this. When we read the Psalms, we ask, where does Jesus fit in this Psalm? Sometimes, like Psalm 1, you could argue, especially verse 1, is about Jesus. It's a, it's a prophecy, a foreshadowing of who Jesus is. But there are other times in other psalms that we read and Jesus is not the actor. In fact, I suggest what he's doing is he's standing next to us and saying, the psalmist is bearing his heart here, but I want you to respond differently than his plea. Think of that psalm that says, you know, happy when the enemy's child, infant's, heads are dashed against rocks. Jesus teaches us something else, does he not? So when we read the scriptures, we ask, where does Jesus fit in that? But as far as Psalm 1 today, it fleshes out Jeremiah and reminds us that we fall short, but Jesus does not. And then there's an application from the epistle today. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and he's using an example that makes perfectly clear the statement I'm trying to make here. Remember, when we walk in the way of the Lord, we're blessed. When we walk in the way of mankind and the humanity that, that tells us and that we look for human beings for our guide, we're going to be cursed. And Paul gives a real life example in the early church where some went astray. The scriptures tell us what? 
We say it in the Apostles' Creed. Jesus was arrested and he was killed under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He died. He was buried. He descended to the place of the dead. And on the third day, what does it tell us? He rose again. And then at the very end of the creed, it says we believe in the resurrection of the dead. This creed is based on the scriptures and the narrative account of the resurrection of Jesus is the scripture that gives us this reality. Jesus died. Jesus rose. Jesus ascended into heaven. And Jesus says, I will come again to judge the living and the dead. And I'll send the Holy Spirit. There's work for you guys to do. And so Paul is addressing some in the early church who said there's no resurrection. And modern heretics today, some of them say there's no such thing as the resurrection. Either, either it was complete falsehood, they all argue, or they'll say that Jesus didn't really die, he was resuscitated, etc., etc. Even the scriptures tell us that one of the stories that was passed around to discredit Christianity is that his body was stolen. Remember that from the scriptures? So Paul is addressing this wrong belief, people following their heart, following their mind, following their conscience, who say, oh no, resurrection for the dead, impossible. But we know there's a scripture verse that says what? With God, all things are possible. And we have the scripture verses that tell us of the resurrection. And so here's the thing. Um, he says right here in verse 14 at the end, our preaching, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And that's really unfortunate. And he repeats the same thing also when he says in verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. I, I hear an English uh, t person that I watch every now and he says, well, that's a shame. <laughs> Isn't it a shame? But it's worse than that, far worse. Verse 19, we are even found to be misrepresenting God if we deny the resurrection. What that means is we're calling God a liar. It means that we say the scriptures mean something, but then we don't believe it. And therefore, we have nothing to offer the world. Because what we have to offer is nothing compared to the offer that Jesus and God and the, Holy, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit give us. We are to be most pitied and we would be calling God a liar. And so when you look at your gospel today, there's that theme again. Blessed and what? Woe. Cursed. It's another way of saying woe to you. Blessed are those who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry now. This is the Beatitudes. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you and exclude you on account of the Son of Man, not on account of what you've done. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy. Your reward is great in heaven, so, so their fathers did to the prophets. And then hear the cursed. Woe to those who are rich. Woe to you who are full now. Woe to you who laugh now. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, so their fathers did to the false prophets. There we are. Traveling the road, we get to the intersection, we go left or we go right. One way is the destination of blessedness, and the other is the destination that leads to woe and cursedness. Our hearts are sick, our conscience is broken, our minds are are shaped by our sin and our desires. What are we to do? Paul asked this question, does he not? What am I to do? And he says, woe to me if I do not have Jesus Christ. And woe to us 
if we do not turn to Christ and say, Lord, what would you have me do? Lord, what should we do? And we have to compare it with the scriptures or we will end up like that early church that Paul is talking to in Corinth where the scriptures say Jesus died, Jesus was raised. And yet, some members of the early church said, no, there's no resurrection. We cannot just go with our gut. Even with a biblically formed gut, it has to be always tested by the scriptures. And the last point I want to make from the gospel, the blessed and the cursed, is we often have a tendency to look at that and look at ourselves, and that's fine. If you're poor, yours is the kingdom of God. If you're hungry, you shall be satisfied. These are promises that can be fulfilled now if the church is working toward that. If you weep, you shall laugh. If people are excluding you and reviling you because of your faith in Christ, rejoice. But look at these woes. And allow these woes to be a mirror. Compared to most of the world today, we are rich. Compared to most of the world today, our bellies are full. After this service, we're going to go have cookies and and fellowship and coffee together. We have that opportunity and that luxury. We have the opportunity to laugh with joy when many people are not laughing because of the sadness and the, and, the, and, the, and the troubles that they're experiencing. And then heaven help us with verse 26. If the world is complimenting us on our behavior as Christians, we may very well not be behaving as Christians. It's the false prophets who get the compliments of the world. Jeremiah, back to Jeremiah, he was a true prophet and he battled false prophets. How do we know this? Because the king and the other rulers, they beat him, they imprisoned him, they threw him in a a dry well to die. He was persecuted because he spoke the word of the Lord. Woe to us if we do not preach Christ, Christ crucified, Christ raised from the dead. Christ, who offers eternal life to all who would accept it. But I hold before you that choice. And then lastly, my friends, that's where we pray for the Holy Spirit to help us make that choice. Help us choose rightly, O Lord. And here's the other reality. Let's say we decide with the aid of the Holy Spirit, let's choose the path of righteousness as we should. But that doesn't mean that we're going to go down a wonderful road with no more challenges, no more potholes, and no more sin from ourselves or opportunities to sin. In fact, more likely than not, that road will narrow and get rougher before it takes us to God's heavenly country. And so we need to continue to ask the Holy Spirit. And remember that wonderful prayer of the father who was asking for the healing of his child. I believe, help me in my unbelief. I love the humility of that prayer because it acknowledges that we're still broken. But we have turned to the great physician for healing. And he will and he does heal us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I do invite you to turn in your prayer book to page 127 and let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We affirm the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and His Church and the basics of our belief. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible, We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, 
of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue now with the prayers of the people. I invite you to kneel as you're able, and Melissa will lead us in the prayers. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Mark, our bishop, for Michael, our priest, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life and in the certain hope of their resurrection, especially Jerry Weed, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. At this time, I write traditional petitions, thanksgivings, and um, the various concerns that you have, you may all work either aloud or silently. Father Grant. 
these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our holy mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you to stand as we pass the peace with one another. The peace of the Lord be always with you and with your spirit. Continuing our offertory sentence in this epiphany season from Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Our offertory hymn is hymn 127, verses 3 and 4. 127, verses 3 and 4. Continue on page 132 of your Book of Common Prayer. <coughs> the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who took on our mortal flesh to reveal his glory that he might bring us out of darkness into his own glorious light. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. I 
invite you to kneel as you're able. We continue on the bottom of page 132. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death, we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory that we might co come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection unto your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. 
I invite you to join with those who are unable to receive communion now to pray the prayer for spiritual communion. It's found on page 677, 677 of your Book of Common Prayer for spiritual communion. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people, gathered around every altar of your church, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is given for me, preserve my body and soul unto everlasting life. Shed for you, preserve your body and soul into everlasting life. Take even remember that Christ died for you, and be on your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
I invite you to join with me with the post-communion prayer. It's found on page 137, page 137 of your Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to turn to page 674, where we have the prayer for union with Christ. Page 674, for union with Christ. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Permit me not to be separated from thee. From the wicked foe, defend me. In the hour of my death, call me and bid me come to thee, that with thy saints I may praise thee forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and, re among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. I just have an announcement or two before we uh, have our dismissal and our processional out. Um, you may have picked up on it or not, David Booman is going to be instituted by the bishop as the next rector of Holy Comforter, and that will occur Thursday. So our Thursday night Bible study is postponed so that we can all go to uh, that uh, event and celebrate with our sister parish the institution of their new rector. Our Wednesday Bible study, which currently meets at Holy Comforter, will continue as normal right now at 6.30 till 7.30, and I'm inspired by uh, leftovers from Friday night to have uh, baked spaghetti. So you, if you liked it, you can get it again, my friends. Um, last but not least, I want to thank everybody for the hard work in preparing uh, the, um, the dinner uh, Friday night. It was well received. It was lots and lots of fun. And if you notice less ladybugs or beetles in here or whatever those creatures are, Thank Gary. He, he helped them go outside yesterday. I invite you next door for refreshments. Alleluia, alleluia. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Our processional hymn is hymn 688, the first and last verses. Mm -hmm. 